Hi everyone, Mike here from Bikes by Mike with another cycling related video. So I'm back upstairs to share with you my own personal advice to those shopping around for a new bike. I'll make the case for why buying a new model year bike makes no sense at all unless money is no object to you. Okay, let's get to it. So a few things I should mention right up front. First, what I'm preaching here is something I've only started recently doing myself. Most of my past bike purchases have been current model year bikes. The only past model year bikes I've ever bought are my two most recent buys. My 2018 Rocky Mountain Suzy Q, which I bought in 2020, and my most recent bike purchase, a third generation Kendale Super 6 EVO, which I bought in June of this year. With prices for bikes having skyrocketed massively over the past four years, it was only this year that I said that I would not buy a current model year bike. I mean, if I could have found one discounted at 25% or more, sure, I would have bought new tech. Otherwise, no way. The second thing I want to mention is that I'm not picking on Cannondale. I've owned three Cannondale bikes over the years, so I really do like their bikes. I could have pulled bike specs and pricing from a dozen other major brands to prove the same point. All I'm doing here is pointing out trends in the bike industry, not suggesting that Cannondale is different than its competitors. The main reason I think it makes no sense to buy current model year bike, unless of course money is no object to you, is that bikes change very little year over year. Like just forget the marketing hype for just a second. Most bike manufacturers come out with new models called new generations every three or four years. So that's where you sometimes see noticeable changes in bike design and tech as compared to prior years. But most of the bike industry today adheres to the model year production cycle, where around the same time every year, bike companies will release their new model year bikes. This is what you typically see at car dealerships. Cannondale and GT were two of the first to ditch the model year cycle a few years back. The thing is, within the same generation year, the bike frame usually doesn't change at all, except maybe for the paint color. So to build my case for why you should seriously be considering past year model bikes, I'll do three things using the Candale Super 6 EVO as an example. But before even looking at specific bikes, we need to consider the UCI's technical regulation on equipment. Why? Because it's important in understanding why all bikes look very much the same. I'll then compare all four generations of the Super 6 EVO from the current model year Lab 71 to the first generation model which ran from 2012 to 2015. I'll show you a side-by-side -side comparison of the frame weights, composite types, and frame geometry so that you can decide for yourself whether the bike has changed much over the past decade or so. The third thing I'll do is compare the build specs and retail prices of the third generation Super 6 with the fourth gen model to show you why I chose to purchase the older of the two models. Okay, so let's start with taking a closer look at the UCI's governing regulation as it'll help explain why bike frames don't really change much year over year. I'd go even farther to say that not only do you not see many differences within the same model year over year, but there isn't a heck of a lot of difference between bike brands for the same class of bikes. If there are performance differences, I'd say that the bike components, the group set, the wheels, the seat posts, stuff like that, has a much greater influence on the overall performance and ride quality of the bike than comparable frames from different bike brands. And it's all to do with rules that govern professional cycling. The UCI is the governing body for all bike racing, whether it's road, mountain biking, cyclocross, trials, every discipline. Any athlete or team that wants to compete in the UCI sanctioned race must adhere to their regulations. Any group that wants to host a UCI sanctioned event must adhere to these regulations. But it is the UCI specific technical regulation on bicycle equipment that limits how much better or how different a bike can be. You see, the overarching mission of the UCI is to ensure fairness and safety in cycling. On the equipment side, the regulations assert the primacy of man over machine, which basically means they want to protect the tradition of cycling and make sure that it is the athlete, not the equipment, that is the main decider of the outcome of races. And to make sure the bike will always look like a bike and not some kind of futuristic Frankenstein bike. Many believe that it was the Lotus 108 and 110 bike that caused the UCI to really crack down on frame designs. 
Article 1.3.020 states that the frame of the bicycle shall be of a traditional pattern, i.e. built around a main triangle, and that the frame set must fit within a template of nine rectangular boxes, each eight centimeters wide, as shown in red boxes in this illustration. Another big one is that the bike cannot weigh less than 6.8 kilograms. Lastly, Article 1.3.006 basically means that we, the general public, must have access to the same equipment that the pros use, or the pros can't be using some special bike that isn't available to anyone else. So there should be little debate that UCI rules prevent innovation leapfrogging in the bike industry. Well, I guess not everyone gets it, so I should probably show you some data to make an even stronger case. Now on to my side-by-side -side comparison of all four generations of the Super 6 EVO. To keep this simple and manageable, I'm going to show you the specs that are most important to the overall quality and ride feel of the frame that are also the easiest to quantify. Let's start with the weights for all size 56 centimeter frames and the carbon fiber composite types. To put the weight differences into perspective, I'll also show you the weight as a percentage of my 70.6 kilogram body weight. What I really wanted to compare was frame set weights, but that data was just too hard to find. So the first generation Super 6 EVO came out in 2012 and ran until 2015. It weighs 695 grams or 1% of my body weight. The second generation Super 6 came out in 2016 and ran until 2019. It weighs 777 grams or 1.1% of my body weight. So the weight actually increased by 82 grams over the previous model. This was due to the slightly more aero tubing on the newer model. Performance claims by bike companies are just that, claims made by the companies that make the bikes, the ones that want to sell you their bikes. So I'll leave it to you to decide how much weight you want to give to these claims. Cannondale claims that their second generation model produces six watt savings over the Gen 1 model at 40 kilometers per hour. Next, we have the third generation model, which was released in 2020 and is the version I bought. It has a claimed weight of 866 grams or 1.2% of my body weight. Candale claims that this model is 30 watts more efficient than the previous model at 48 kilometers per hour. So the weight has gone up again due to the addition of more carbon fiber material used to create more aero tubing. Now we have the latest generation of the Super 6 EVO, the fourth gen top of the line Lab 71. It weighs 770 grams or 1.1% of my body weight. It also has a claim drag reduction over the previous third gen model of 12 watts at 45 kilometers per hour. So there you go. All the generations of the Super 6 EVO going back 11 years. Some differences in the type of carbon fiber composite used, but not much difference in weight when you consider that the bike components and the rider make up the vast majority of their overall weight, not the frame. Now let's look closely at how much the bike geometry of the Super 6 has changed over the various iterations of the bike. Bike companies are always claiming to be such forward-thinking innovators. Let's see if that's actually the case. To help us visualize any changes in frame geometry, I'm going to use the bikeinsights.com website. It's a great free community-based resource that, among other things, allows you to compare the frame geometry of different bikes. Let's start with a comparison of the Gen 1 versus Gen 2 Super 6 EVO. The Super 6 Gen 1 is in the white outline and the Gen 2 the black outline. You can see that the bike geometry of the two bikes is pretty much the same. Looking at specific frame measurements, you can also see that for most parts of the bike geometry, the two bikes are within a couple millimeters of one another. The biggest difference is the stack and reach. Stack and reach are two of the most important geometry elements that impact how a bike feels. A bike with a higher stack paired with a shorter reach is more comfort focused, while a bike with a lower stack and a longer reach is more race oriented. The newer Gen 2 model is slightly less racy than the Gen 1 model, but both are rated within the average range for performance bikes. But again, here we're talking about very small differences of less than a centimeter. Okay, now let's compare the Gen 2 model with the Gen 3. The 2022 Super 6 EVO is a version I ride. At first glance, the geometry of the two bikes looks very different, but it's a bit of an optical illusion created by the longer seat tube on the Gen 2 model. 
Seat tube length by itself doesn't impact ride quality because it is only one of the bike elements that determines stack and reach. And when comparing the stack and reach of the two bikes, we notice a similar difference to what we saw between the Gen 1 and Gen 2 models. The newer Gen 3 is very slightly less racy than the Gen 2 model, but both are rated within the average range for performance bikes. The last comparison is most important as we are comparing the difference between the current model year bike and the previous generation bike. We're not only comparing different model year bikes, but two different generation models as well. Or how did the reviewer put it? Oh yeah, it's so different, it's a brand new bike. Here you can see that this year's 2023 Super 6 EVO is basically identical to the previous third generation EVO. Looking at the frame measurements of the two bikes, you can see that everything, not just the stack and reach, is within two millimeters of the other. Those are not differences you'll feel on the bike. Heck, you can barely see those differences with the naked eye. So to sum it up, while there are very slight differences in bike geometry between the first, second, and third generation bikes, the geometry hasn't changed at all between the third generation Super 6 EVO and the current model year, the Gen 4. Yes, there are some slight changes in the tubing shape between the two bikes, but the geometry is the same. Looking at the two bikes side by side, you may be able to see subtle differences between the two bikes, but they are very minor. At the risk of beating a dead horse here, let's look at all four generations of the Super 6 EVO together to visualize how closely they match up in geometry and shape. I hope I've made a good case that the differences between these four frames is really, really small, especially between the current Gen 4 model and the third generation Super 6 EVO. If I haven't made that case, then I've wasted your time and mine, and you're probably not going to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Now, let's look at the build specs between my third generation Super 6 EVO and see how it compares to the newest 4th Gen Super 6 Lab 71. The quality of the build between the two bikes is virtually identical for the most important and most expensive components, the group set and the wheels. Both bikes come with Shimano's 12-speed DI2, and both bikes are stocked with Cannondale's hologram wheel set. My 3rd Gen bike has the 45mm deep not carbons, and the 4th Gen version has a slightly deeper 50mm RSL carbon wheel set. The frame material between the two bikes is different. My third generation bike has Cannondale's previous top tier carbon, the Super 6 EVO high mod carbon, while the newer Gen 4 has Cannondale's much hyped Lab 71 Series 0 carbon. How different are those two carbon layups and does it have any impact on ride quality? Not sure anyone has an honest answer to that. Personally, I think it's a marginal improvement at best. Now let's look at the prices of these two bikes at the time I made my purchase in June of this year. I paid $10,999 Canadian, excluding tax, for my bike, which was 35% off the manufacturer's suggested retail price of $17,065. Yes, I got an amazing discount on this bike, but if you're buying a previous model bike, you almost always are going to get a good deal. The new fourth generation Super Sex EVO retailed at the time for $19,290 Canadian, and like almost all new releases, was not on sale anywhere in Canada. So that's a massive savings to me of $8,291 in choosing last year's model bike. And that's why I say that unless money is no object to you, buying a current model year bike rarely makes sense. Actually, in my case, I prefer the third generation frame or the Lab 71, because my frame has a press fit 30 BB, while the new fourth gen has a threaded BSA bottom bracket. I guess I'm one of the few that actually like press fit BBs. 
They are lighter than threaded BBs, cost less to replace, I have several on hand, and I know how to replace them. Tell me what you think. Do you like that the industry is now going to threaded BBs? So that's pretty much it. My long-winded explanation for why I think it rarely makes sense to buy the newest model year bike. Tell me what you think in the comment section below. That's all I got for today, folks. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And if you're not subscribed to this channel, please subscribe as it allow me to produce more content for all of you. See you next time. Happy rolling.